Well, we're going to start with a hymn about Jesus' love, and that's 448. 448. Matt's got a cold, and Brett has a cold, but, so I miss Matt not being here to lead the singing. I, I enjoy having him lead the singing, but I might pray that he'll get back on his feet again. So this is a great hymn. It talks about being amazed in the presence of Jesus Christ when we consider his love for us. And that's what this hymn is all about, how much love Jesus Christ had for us, how he could love us as a condemned sinner, how he prayed in the garden, not my will, but thine. And he was shedding tears of grief, not for himself, uh, but for us. And he took all my sins and my sorrows and made them his, his very own. Okay, that's quite something. And then died alone on the cross of Calvary. And then the last verse talks about, <clears throat> "'Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me." Well, we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to do that. Uh, we ought to be able, uh, glad to be able to sing uh, of his love for me right now. Right? Uh, eternity, we have eternal life. Our eternal life began the day we were saved. And we ought to start uh, preparing for eternity by singing to the praise of his, his love for me even now. How, how can we think we're going to do it throughout eternity if we're not doing it now, right? So <clears throat> let's stand and we'll sing My Savior's Love. We're thankful to you this morning that uh, your love for us is an abiding love. We don't ever have to worry about it running out. Uh, we're so, we so much appreciate the time to be able to spend with you this morning, worship, glorifying your name, uh, learning more of how to be what you want us to be. 
We ask that you would encourage our hearts and, and strengthen our faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can be seated. And turn to 558, 558. The evidence of our Savior's love is a nail-scarred hands. All right, let's sing that. to remember to turn this microphone on and off at times through the service. So I'm trying to do that, but I think uh, I'm making some mistakes. Keep it on. That'd be better probably, wouldn't it? Okay, I'll just do that. Yeah. All right. So, uh, as far as announcements this morning, uh, we have our preaching course that we've been doing in the afternoon at four o'clock. We'll plan on that again today. And uh, lately we've been looking at <clears throat> hermeneutics, uh, the proper way to interpret the scriptures. And so that's uh, this afternoon. At five o'clock we normally have song practice, but I'm not sure that Matt's going to be up for that. So I think we will plan not to have the song practice tonight unless you want to do something with the younger ones. Uh, probably not. Okay, so we'll... We'll uh, postpone the song practices for a week and plan on it next week and not tonight. Uh, 
We have our regular prayer service on Wednesday at, at 7. That's important to uh, have time of praying to the Lord. We can share our prayer requests and remember to pray for our missionaries. We pray, pray for the Lord to work in our own hearts here and, and do His will in and through us. <clears throat> uh, Thursday is Kids Compass. We're also due for a deacon's meeting, and that would be in that, uh, Matt and Vicky's house this Thursday. We'll see how Matt's going by then. And, uh, but I'll stay in touch with you, Jim, and we'll decide depending on how things go that way. Uh, keep in mind, there are some special services in Tremont this week. I think they begin on Thursday and go through Sunday. But uh, Thursday being Kids Compass and our deacons meeting, uh, it looks like probably the two options that would be easiest for us will be Friday and Saturday. Of course, you folks can go any of those times, but uh, uh, planning on, I'm planning on going up Friday and Saturday. I think uh, Barbara and Rowena were wanting to go up, so we'll plan on taking you up Friday night, and that's at 6.30 p.m. Pastor Craig Cobb uh, will be preaching there. So uh, <clears throat> keep that in mind if you'd like to go. I think that's it as far as our announcements go this morning. Uh, maybe, uh, Blaine, would you mind collecting our offering and tithes for us, please? Okay, and could you uh, lead us in prayer? All right, uh, 613. I think this relates to the, the love of the Lord Jesus for us. It's, the hymn is trusting Jesus. But, you know, it's easier to trust somebody when you know that they love you, right? Uh, if you know somebody loves you, then that builds confidence and we can trust them. And that's one of the reasons we know we can trust Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy in life. There may be some difficulties, uh, but if, if it's all by God's design, we know that He loves us. We know that it's going to be all for, for good in the end. Uh, him that Iris Sankey uh, put the, the music to here. All right, uh, let's sing the whole hymn. Stay 
This morning, we're going to be looking a little more on charity and what it means to have charity. And let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. I believe we've left off with verse 6 last time. That's where we'll pick it up this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, start reading in verse 1. Emphasizing, of course, the importance of charity in Christian ministry, the exercising of our spiritual gifts, how we interact with one another as believers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, but also how we interact with the un unsaved, the lost, those who have not turned to Jesus Christ for salvation. Uh, charity is a very important element uh, and a very important virtue to add to our lives, and the Lord here is emphasizing that we can have all these gifts and abilities and talents, but if we don't have charity with it, it's, it's useless. We're nothing without charity. So verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. I'll tell you, it's impossible to have that kind of charity without the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Uh, we need the Lord in our lives to have that kind of charity developed in us. We probably won't have it to perfection in this life. We understand that. But we can have it a little more, a little more measure of that if we just take to heart some of the things the Lord has told us here. So for that reason, I encourage us just to pray about it, say, Lord, what is it you'd have me to work on that I have uh, more of, of the charity that you want me to have? So this morning, we're going to look at the fact that charity rejoiceth in the truth, and that's what we'll spend our time this morning. All right, let's uh, ask the Lord uh, to go before uh, this particular passage of Scripture while we study it. Our Father, we're thankful that you do give the Word to us. Uh, it is something that we can rely upon. 
we are needy, Lord, and we're not complete without you in our lives. Uh, we try to fill that spiritual void in ourselves with activities and, and maybe generosities and acts of kindness and good works and things like that. But Lord, there's no replacement for yourself. And we're thankful that you gave yourself for us. We're thankful that Jesus had that kind of love. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we go through this study and as we go through our lives, we'll have a little more of the love of Christ developed in ourselves and how we interact with one another. Well, bless your word. Make it profitable to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 601, 601. Having the, the love of the Lord Jesus is a very firm foundation. We can trust that. Let's stand uh, while we do sing. seated. <clears throat> Amen means so be it, let it be. And uh, that's what we should desire is that God's word would be effective and as we learn more of what we ought to be, we say let it be, let that be in my life. And that's uh, what we would desire the outcome to be as we study charity, that we would desire, Lord, let that be in my life. Let charity be in my life. And uh, we're looking at various ways that charity expresses itself. And this morning, it is how charity rejoices or rejoiceth in the truth. So before we get started, we do uh, need to ask the Lord's blessing on it. Father, thank you for your word. We are thankful that we can learn from it. I pray that we will be teachable, Lord. You're the great teacher. You've given us a, a textbook here uh, that is 
not just facts, but it is very practical. There are things that we can implement as we study them this morning. Uh, we ask you to press upon each heart individually the thing that you would have us to work on. Uh, help us to see the value of truth and how there is that connection between your love and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So verse 6 really is a contrast, isn't it? I'd like to spend just a moment uh, thinking about that contrast because it starts out uh, that charity, of course this is all about charity, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So that word but indicates that there is a contrast here between the first part of the verse and the second part of the verse. Uh, Charity rejoiceth in the truth. In other words, it is not that. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, so it's not that. But it does rejoice in the truth. It is that. So that's a contrast. It's saying what it isn't and saying what it is. What it doesn't do, what it does do. Uh, There are two times then it mentions in this verse, rejoiceth. One has to do with iniquity. The other has to do with truth. And... uh, those two words really have a little bit of different emphasis. It doesn't come through the same in our English. Uh, the original Greek text had that difference. They used uh, two different words there for the, for the rejoiceth, basically meaning the same thing, but a little different emphasis on each one. Uh, the first rejoiceth in iniquity, that kind of rejoicing means to be calmly happy, calmly happy. And when you think about that, it says, rejoiceth not in iniquity. Think of it that way, uh, that charity is not calmly happy in iniquity. There is that uh, tendency that we can have, especially when we're unsaved, to be just calmly happy in our iniquity. We're not really disturbed by it. We're not really upset by it. We can kind of be contented in engaging in certain sinful activities because we have a lost soul. We are separated from God, and that, that uh, sin nature within us is calmly happy engaging in sinful conduct, in sinful living. And that's what rejoiceth in iniquity is. Obviously, there is a lack of comprehension of the love of Christ for me to be calmly happy in iniquity. If we really grasp the love of Christ for me, and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary, and why it was necessary, and it was because of my iniquity that it was necessary, we'd have difficulty being calmly happy in our sin and in our iniquity. And praise God when he begins to work in a person's life where they're no longer calmly happy in iniquity and calmly happy in sin, and they're disturbed by it, and they're disturbed by the fact that I'm alienated from God because of that sin, And I'm disturbed by the fact that God loved me even though I'm a sinner and engaged in this willful disobedience and rebellion against God. He still loved me. He still came to the cross and died for those sins, my sins, on the cross of Calvary. That if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I have forgiveness of sins. My sin record is wiped clean. It's totally made a a clean slate. And what a glorious feeling that is to know there is nothing between me and my God anymore. God has wiped it out. It's clean. And now I can go on and live for the Lord. And I'll tell you, from that day forward, uh, when you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, you no longer are calmly uh, interested in sin or calmly content with sin. It's disturbing to us. You're not calmly happy in it. Uh, In fact, you desire to be rid of it and have it removed from your life. Praise the Lord for that, that he does that change in us. So that is, uh, when it talks about rejoiceth in iniquity, it has that kind of an emphasis to it, being calmly happy in it. Uh, The second uh, rejoiceth that is mentioned in verse 6 is the contrast. It says rejoiceth in the truth. Rejoiceth in the truth. And that has the idea of being in union with. 
the truth. That is, to be in companionship with the truth. Yes, it, ha it can be calmly happy, but it's, it's a stronger word than that. Not, not that charity is just calmly happy in the truth. It is actually <clears throat> uh, an associate of truth. It's in companionship with truth. It is in close camaraderie with truth. That's what charity is. And we find that to be the case in Scripture, that, that truth is borne out in the, in the Bible for us. Uh, for example, Psalm 40, verse 11 says, uh, there the psalmist says, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Uh, very frequently, you will find the loving kindness of God associated with the truth of God. That God's, God is truth, but closely tied with it will be his loving kindness. Uh, that God has that perfect ability to blend truth and loving kindness together. Uh, we don't have uh, that ability. I wish we did. Uh, but that's one of the things the Lord would work into our lives is to have that good balance of loving kindness and truth working together in our hearts. So charity and truth then complement one another. <clears throat> so, so they actually make each other more what they ought to be. Uh, Truth is all it ought to be when charity is present with it. Uh, truth is not all that it ought to be in the absence of charity. Charity is all it ought to be when truth is present in it. And there is something lacking in charity if there is not that base of truth operating in that love or that charity. So they're very much attracted to one another. And whatever the truth is, charity will gravitate to that. In other words, charity loves to be where truth is. <laughs> it just, uh, they're just bound together. All right, so uh, that's the contrast we find in verse 6. I thought that was worth mentioning just for our understanding. But let's move on from that to a real basic question. What is truth? Now, we wouldn't think you'd have to ask that, but you look around yourself today, and as you have to ask that, because there is a, a total lack of understanding what truth is today. I couldn't help but think of Pilate on John, in John 18, 38, <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate is talking with him. It says, Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. No fault at all in the Lord. Now, that question, what is truth, makes you think that uh, in Pilate's mind, it was kind of an abstract thing. It was... Uh, kind of a fluctuating thing where you can't really be known. And this was all in response to what the Lord Jesus had to say to him. Uh, Pilate had asked him a question, Art thou a king then? But Jesus' answer to that was, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So the Lord Jesus made it very clear to Pilate <clears throat> for the, the purpose he was born and for, the, for that cause he came into the world to bear witness unto the truth. Pilate's response to that is, what is truth? And he walked out. <clears throat> it doesn't seem he was really interested in knowing what the truth was. And it shows a particular viewpoint regarding truth. 
that it wasn't as absolute. It wasn't an absolute. Now, I'll tell you today, <clears throat> people do not, uh, society in general does not believe that there is such a thing as absolute truth. Uh, there's a lot of this thinking today that truth is whatever you make it out to be. Uh, you can have your own truth. You can create your own truth. Uh, you're born a biological male, you can be a female. That's your reality. That's your truth. This is, this is bizarre, ungodly, demonic thinking that there's no absolute truth. It's an, it comes with the abandonment of the Word of God. You wonder, how does a society get to the place where we're at today? We get there because the Bible is the base of truth. If you have no base of truth, then it's, it's nothing there. It's whatever you want to make it out to be. There is an absolute truth, however. It is the Word of God. And we're going to, every man is going to be accountable for this book and what they do with it one day. So to Pilate, in his mind, truth was elusive. It wasn't absolute. It wasn't something that's really knowable, <clears throat> much like what we see around us today. But we need to be careful that we not be uh, corrupted, that our thinking not be corrupted by the, this push in society, that we know the, the truth. We, we adhere to the truth, and we not yield it up. By definition, truth is conforming to fact or reality. If you want a definition of truth, we know what it is, but uh, that's really what it is. It's, it's conforming to fact and reality. This is reality. It's the way it really is. Truth conforms to that. It is the real state of facts or things. It's the real state of them. And because of that, truth is very exact. Uh, if we were doing a mathematical equation, and we, some of those mathematical equations can be fairly lengthy. They go on and on and on. Uh, and you have to do, follow a certain process. But in the end, there is an exact answer to that equation. If you're off by a number, uh, one figure in that final answer, that final number, if one of those numbers is wrong, that's, that's an untruthful answer. That answer is not the true answer. Only when that exact number is reached is it a true answer. So it's very exact. And that's what truth is. Truth is very exact. And uh, so is true today. There are men, there are women, and biology determines which is which. And People cannot create their own reality or their own truth. The facts are the facts. Reality is reality. This is what it is. And whether they want to believe it or not, uh, that's up to them. But they're going to be answerable for the truth. Just as we are. <clears throat> All right, so uh, there's some things about truth itself that I think we do well to remind ourselves. Uh, yes, it is exact, but truth is also enlightening. Uh, it it uh, enlightens us. Psalm 43, 3. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. That's Psalm 43, 3. Notice how there uh, light and truth are tied together. And that is very common in Scripture, that truth is equated with light. And that is because it gives understanding. It gives knowledge. We can say that truth contains this element of being unconcealed. It's, it's out in the open. It's evident. It's plain to see. And that's part of what truth is. It is revealing and not concealing. It is obvious. At least that's, uh, you would think things that are obvious today would be obvious to all people, but people are, uh, tend to turn a blind eye to the obvious. 
And there, therein lies the problem. Well, the Bible does equate truth with light for that reason, that it is enlightening. It helps us to understand things and to uh, have knowledge about things. Uh, another thing about truth is that God's Word is truth. God's Word is truth. That is because the Bible shows us the way things really are. Praise God that God does not put anything in this book that is not the way it really is. There is, real, there is such a thing as real sin. There is such a thing as being separated from God by sin. There is a real thing in heaven. There is a real thing in hell. There is a real way to escape. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ. These are real things, and man is wise if he looks and sees these real things, and we can know that they're real because God has plainly given them to us. God's Word is plain. It is clear about sin. It is clear about salvation. It is clear about uh, God, and it's clear about heaven. It's clear about hell. These are clear teachings of the Bible and that is because they are truth. And the Bible is clear as to what the truth is. And, the, and in our world, that base of truth is the Word of God, what God says. He created this world. He created mankind to live in it. He, he has created all things. And He has given us a book of the truth that tells us the reality of how He's created everything and how things really are in this world. And the Bible tells us that it's very effective in showing the reality of things. Let's look at Hebrews 4.12 for just a minute. Well, the Word of God is quick. In other words, uh, the Bible uses the word quick like alive. It's operative. It's working. It's active. The Word of God is quick. It's alive. It's acting. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What the Bible does, it reveals what you really think and what you really love and what your affections really are. And this is the truthful work that God's Word does when we read it and when we study it and, and when we... Uh, spend time together around it like we are this morning, it breaks through profession to what is truly going on in our minds and in our heart. It shows what our true affections really are. So it helps us to see things for the way they really are. The Bible, it is through the Bible that we can see that we're the sinners that we really are. We really are sinners alienated from God. And it's through the Bible we can see that reality. We can see that God is a holy God and must judge sin. We can see that from the Bible. But we can also see very clearly that God loves us and gave himself for us and is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and receive eternal life through the hands of Jesus Christ outstretched on the cross of Calvary. Yes, that is the reality, the love of God for us. But we would not know these realities apart from the Word of God. We need the Word of God to show us the way things really are and to show us what we really are.
2 Thessalonians 2.10 talks about a very sad state of affairs that people fall into. That with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Why do men perish eternally? Why do they spend an eternity in hell? It's because they receive not the love of the truth. You see, love and truth go together, don't they? And the truth of our need for salvation is there, but the love of God is coupled with that truth, and he came and died on the cross of Calvary. And there is that love of the truth, the saving work of Jesus Christ that can be received, but if it's not received, we perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Yes, we can be saved. Every person can be saved. But the love of God, the truth of God's love, as expressed in the Word of God, has to hit the heart and change our affection, change our desire, and cause us to see the way things really are. So yes, uh, truth is God's word. <clears throat> truth is also honest. And for that reason, <laughs> truth sometimes goes against our grain. Charity will tell us the truth about what we are. And it's honest about that. And sometimes the Word of God goes against us. We don't like it. We don't like what it says. But you know what? It's honest. It's the truth. And we would benefit if we would just heed that truth <laughs> and allow it to, to speak to our hearts, even though it does at times go against our grain. Understand that truth is love, but sometimes truth does go against our grain. Truth is formidable as well. And by that I mean it is unyielding. It will not give up. Its reality is reality. You can be a biological male and say all day long that you're a female, but you know what? You're still a man. It's biological. And that truth is formidable. It is unyielding, and it will not give up its ground. It will not surrender to error. And if we run on error of false assumptions, of false pre perceptions, eventually we're going to run into that wall of truth. And men can say and do and create their own reality all they want today. But one day they're going to run into that wall of truth where they have to stand before God and give account. And that is a formidable wall. That is a wall that does not yield, it does not bend the truth. Those truth does have a strong side to it. Charity is loving, but it's also strong. It is strong in the truth. And charity is very uncomfortable in the presence of error or lying. Not very comfortable there. I will say this, that there is a false charity <clears throat> that is prevalent in the world. Uh, we're talking about charity by God's definition. This is true charity. There is a false charity, a false love that's out there in the world that basically says you, you can love error. You, know, you can love all sorts of things. It's a compromise of the truth. And that's fully condemned in the Bible. Proverbs 17, 15, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth, that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. That's the truth. If you justify the wicked, or you condemn the just, you're abomination to the Lord. That's the fact. That's the reality. 
The world has this false charity that, that tolerates sin and wickedness and say it's not loving to, if you don't tolerate sin and wickedness, what the Bible defines as sin and wickedness. Oh, you've got to, you can love the person. God loves the person. He loves the sinner. He hates the sin. And sin is sin. Wickedness is wickedness. Righteousness is righteousness. It's all by God's definition. And that is the reality. You want to know what real sin is? Read the Bible. If you want to know what real righteousness is, read the Bible. It will define these things for you. That will be the reality. But charity is not comfortable condoning what is wicked and ungodly. These are the ones that would suppress or hold down the truth. They don't want to acknowledge that the Bible is the truth. And that's what I need to conform to. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That literally means to suppress it, to hold it down. All right, but truth is also protective. It has a protective quality to it. It protects from deception and error. Truth prevents a person from being easily deceived. Once you know the truth and you're sure of it, you're not going to be easily persuaded away from it. When truth is believed and adhered to, it protects from harmful error and misconceptions. Truth builds strong confidence and conviction, and, it, and it's not easily moved. It brings stability to a person's life. So they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It's important to know the Scriptures, to know the truth of the Scriptures, so we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You get pulled this way and pulled that way by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There is a lot of deception out there. And the only way to, to see through all of this deception is to know the truth and to stand on that truth. And the, praise God, he's given us a Bible that can give us the truth and bring stability to our lives and that we can believe it be convinced of it, stand on it, and not be tossed to and fro. So truth is protective. It protects from error. It protects from a lot of dangers that come with error. Then truth is also constancy. It's some, uh, maybe somewhat related to its strength, but it, uh, the idea is that it's, it continues on. It, it, in other words, it doesn't run out. There isn't a time coming when truth isn't valid. It's constant. It's unchanging. It remains the same. And our God is that kind of God. He re never changes. He remains the same. He's the God of truth. And that's one of the works that charity will do in your life. It will make you constant and never... Uh, always more obedient to the Word of God, having that obedience be a consistent thing in our lives. Charity has a consistency to it, a continuation to it. And I think it's so encouraging to see someone that stands on a truth of the Word of God, and they stand on that right through to the day they die. They never abandon that truth. That shows that that truth really got a hold of their heart. They really did believe it. You got to wonder how much they believed if they made a profession about it here and abandon it there at the end of life, there's something that was not really nailed down in the heart and mind when that takes place. Truth doesn't change. It stays consistent. There is this thing called situational ethics. Well, charity <laughs> knows nothing of that. It doesn't depend on the situation, what your morals will be or what you believe. It believes the truth and stays it doesn't waver depending on the situation at the time. 
It stays constant. And for that reason, it is dependable. It is reliable. You can count on it. You know where it stands. That's kind of nice. Always know what to expect. But one of the ways that charity rejoices in the truth, and I'll just be able to touch on this very quickly, but there are some practical ways that charity does uh, rejoice in the truth. First, in our speech and conduct, it show itself there. You will speak truthfully and honestly. What you say will be the truth. And the Bible promotes presenting truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So the truth needs to be spoken in love. Galatians 4.16, Paul was concerned because he told the Galatians some truths out of concern for them, out of love for them. But he says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Even if the truth is presented in love, people may still resent it. But you're governed. You are to be governed by charity. A lot has to do with presentation, doesn't it? Ephesians 4.25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. We are members one of another. So truth, truth in speech and truth in conduct always acts consistent <clears throat> with what is true. That means not being a hypocrite. Right? We can be a hypocrite. We live inconsistent with what we profess. That's not charity. Charity is not hypocritical. It lives exactly like it professes. Charity rejoices in truth by keeping God's word and keeping its own word. Right? If he says he's going to do something, he does it. That's truthful, isn't it? If you make a promise, I'll do this, and then you don't do it, that's, that's not being truthful. So charity always follows through and does what it says it will do. That's being truthful and honest. And charity loves the truth of God's word and keeps it pure. That is, the, the modern corruptions of the word of God are resisted by charity. And it would stick to the preserved word of God as God had given it to us. We know in English it's the King James Version. Well, that's why we stick to it today. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. I tell you, it should be a joy to, to spend time in the word of God and uh, have it sanctify us, to purify us. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we love the word of God, we will study it and dissect it accurately. Be careful to how we handle the word of God. It takes some study, and the, the study of God that dissects it accurately uh, makes us a workman that's approved of God. And that's what we would desire to be. Charity... Uh, handles the Word of God in such a fashion as that. Charity loves being in a church where the Word of God is, is presented and it is the pillar and ground of the truth. That's how we know charity loves to be in church. If it is the pillar and ground of the truth, charity will love to be there. Loves the house of God. Charity rejoices at the success of the gospel, seeing a soul saved. Oh, there's rejoicing in the heart to see a soul saved. It's enlightening that Luke 15, 10 says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. You know what that tells us about heaven? It is it radiates with an atmosphere of charity. 
You know, we can't imagine living in a place that charity is the atmosphere of the whole place. And that is what heaven is like. It radiates the love of God, the charity, so that the angels of God rejoice over one sinner that repenteth. That's possible because charity is prevalent in heaven. It, it dominates the whole atmosphere of heaven. And I'll tell you, it's a wonderful thing when charity dominates the atmosphere of a local church. It is a wonderful place to be. I'm thankful for the, the love that the Lord has exhibited uh, through, uh, to one another through our church here. I'm not saying there isn't room to grow, but I'm just saying there is that, that love that is there that, that makes it a, a, an enjoyable place to be. And I tell you, it's the love of God that makes heaven, that's going to make heaven so enjoyable a place to be. And it, if, to the extent the Lord Jesus is present in the church, that's what makes the church a, an enjoyable place to be. Charity rejoices when a believer takes the truth of God's word to heart. Oh, I tell you, doesn't it? You see a believer make a decision in their life to follow the word of God. Yes, you rejoice over a sinner that repents, but it's so rejoice, it just rejoices your heart to see another believer go on and serve the Lord. Make a decision for the Lord and follow through with it. Make a life change. That rejoice, charity rejoices at that. Charity rejoices at the true and honest ex honesty expressed by, by others, by believers. Now, sometimes the honesty is not that pretty. But it's honest. And charity appreciates honesty. And sometimes acknowledging our sin isn't a pretty thing. But it's an honest thing. And charity loves that honesty, that willingness to say, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done that, confessing our faults one to another. That's charity at work in a membership. Charity loves to see true religion flourish. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's, what, that's where charity loves to see that kind of religion flourish. But I think over it all, charity loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, he's Jesus Christ. But John 14, 6 says, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Lord Jesus is the truth. John mentioned that in chapter 1 as well. We beheld, his, and we beheld him uh, the glory of, uh, as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Lord Jesus is truth. That's what he said when he stood before Pilate. I came to, to manifest the truth. And because Jesus is the truth, Charity rejoices in Jesus Christ. And, and charity is at work in our hearts. We will cherish and love the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the question really this morning is how much do you cherish truth and value truth? And uh, charity, when he's at work in our lives, highly values truth, is actually a companion of it, and his union with it, is associated with it, makes it be all that it ought to be, and that's the kind of charity we need to have. Father, thank you for our time. I ask thy blessing upon your word. We're thankful that you're a God of truth. You have given that truth to us in your word. Uh, you made it plain. Pray that we will just adhere to it, stick to it, believe it, allow it to change our lives and our hearts. We're thankful for how it presents Jesus Christ and his love for us. I pray that uh, those that are unsaved, that are around us here, maybe within earshot of this live stream, 
will uh, understand and appreciate your love for them and that there is a way to be made right and to have hope of heaven through Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, <clears throat> we'll close with hymn 531, 531. We're able to know things because there are true things, and we can know the truth. So let's stand and uh, sing 531. Father, we're thankful that you're a God that uh, doesn't forget us. You put your love upon us. You died on the cross for our sins. And that any that would turn to you, you would not turn away. And once we have turned to you and called upon you to forgive our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive them and to impart to us that eternal life of Jesus Christ. And then you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. And therein we have that hope of eternity with yourself. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Pray that that love of Christ will show in and through our lives more each day. In Jesus' name, amen.